Good morning everyone and welcome to our special additional webinar this month in which we're going to discuss how employers can support their employees through the menopause. We're pleased to welcome members of the Meeting Industry Association today. HR Solutions and MIA are working in partnership to bring you this information uh, webinar today. So thank you to Kevin McPhee, um, MIA's Chief Executive, for supporting this webinar and this very important subject. So for those of you who are new today to our webinar, I would just like to introduce ourselves. I'm Victoria Templeton, the HR Knowledge Manager here at HR Solutions, and I'm joined by Sue Watson, Sue's our Operations Director, and she'll be joining me in taking your questions um, at the end and discussing the topics through our polls. We also have technical support from Hannah Wallace, who will be on hand in the background if anybody runs into any technical challenges. Hopefully that won't be the case, but if you do and you are still able to use your dashboard, please just drop Hannah a message. And because we've got so many of you who have joined us today, we've placed you all on mute, but we do want to hear your questions as we always do in our webinars. So when you see this slide, this means we're at the end of the webinar and we're ready to take your live questions. And today, in addition to Sue and I taking your questions, we are joined by Rob Copperley, one of our senior HR consultants. Rob provides um, HR support to MIA and will be asking Sue and I some of your questions that have already been raised with us as part of the registration process for today's event. And actually, Rob's going to be asking us um, many questions, some of which are obviously from a male perspective. So this is a really important area if we want to start engaging in open conversations on this important topic, you know, how we can help um, male managers in particular. So we're booked in for the hour and we're happy to continue um, if we do get uh, a few extra questions, obviously time permitting. Um, so um, hopefully you can stay right through to the question and answer session at the end. Here's a quick run through of how you can submit your questions. So on the screen now you'll see an image of your GoToWebinar, which looks something like this. You simply type in your questions in that question pane that you can see here, and then submit. And then, as I said, we'll read those out in the, uh, the final section of the webinar. And we usually like to run several polls throughout our webinars because it makes it more of an engaging webinar for everybody. And actually, we find that those that attend our webinars find them really informative because it gives you an idea of um, what other organizations are doing, what are um, current employers thinking in terms of the particular topic that the subject's about. So hopefully, um, we'll find these uh, really informative as well. So when you see this slide, it means we're going to do the webinar. All I just ask that if you'd like to participate, make sure you're not in the full screen mode um, and uh, GoToWebinar will um, allow you to participate. So this is what I thought I would cover. So first of all, it's important to understand the context around the menopause and understand it, uh, because from there you know how um, you can then approach it from a practical basis in your workplace. I'm going to talk about an employer's legal duty, just highlight that for you. But the main bulk of the webinar is really about the practical support um, and the steps that you can take to support your employees. And as I said, we'll have a Q&A session at the end um, and we'll invite Rob at that point to come in and join us with those uh, questions. So I thought I'd start off with some context and put in some um, statistics actually up front. And actually, 13 million of the UK's entire female population are peri stroke menopausal and that's according to research by the NHS England uh, February 2022 and you know it's just interesting seeing the statistics because it really hits home and puts into context you know what it is that we're supporting um, at work so there's 13 million um, of the UK's entire female population going through the menopause. And actually of that figure, we know, know from the same research that 80% are going through it whilst working. And so actually the number of women who will experience the menopause whilst in employment is increasing. Um, we know that pre-pandemic research showed that women over the age of 50 were the fastest growing group in the workforce. So really it is an important um, health um, and well-being issue that really employers need to sort of understand, try and then work out what practical steps they can put in place to support that because the statistics are sort of um, very interesting in, in highlighting the impact. 
and there were currently around 4.5 um, million women aged between 50 and 64 in employment um, and according to research that formed part of an inquiry by the House of Commons Women and Equalities Committee, this is probably about 18 months ago, um, they found that women are staying in work for longer. Um, so take, for example, back in 1986, the average age of the labour market exit was uh, 60. By 2020, it increased to 64, um, uh, 64.395. So um, the evidence of the inquiry pointed out that women in this age group are highly likely highly skilled and experienced and typically at the peak of their careers and also you know we've got to remember that they are role models for younger workers too so um you know 4.5 million of um the workforce are women in employment so that's a staggering figure and we also know from research back in 2022 uh, from Bupa that 900,000 employees had left their employment because of the menopausal symptoms. And what we'll come on to find out that actually menopausal symptoms, you know, they can vary person to person. Um, it's very individual to somebody. And even the length of time that somebody experiences the symptoms can vary. Um, but staggeringly, 900,000 employees had left their jobs because of those symptoms. So what we're going to do now before we get into just understanding a little bit more is just run three quick polls and really the first one if I can ask Sue to help with uh, launching the polls is are you currently supporting a colleague who is going through the menopause right now? Okay, a little bit longer, perhaps. Yep. I think we'll. Yeah. Okay, I'll close that poll and share the results for you. Okay, so 31% of you are. So hopefully um, today's webinar is going to be really helpful for you and give you some ideas to take away that you can implement. 69% of you aren't, um, but potentially there could be people in your workforce that may be experiencing, but perhaps haven't told you, you know, um, you, you're not aware. Um, so it'll be interesting as we go through the webinar, as we talk about some of the symptoms and how it, uh, um, I guess, manifests itself in the workplace, it might start probably uh, raising questions in your own mind, whether perhaps you do have somebody in team that um, may be experiencing it. Obviously, um, it's for each individual to um, determine as to how much information they share with their employer, but nevertheless, just sort of interesting. Mm -hmm. So the next poll is about uh, confidence in managing the menopause. How do you feel um, in managing it, even if perhaps you don't have anybody at the moment that you're supporting? Okay, I'll yeah. close that poll, share those results. <clears throat> okay. So um, it's great that we've got um, some of you who have joined us today that are very confident in uh, supporting that. Um, and hopefully there'll be ideas that we talk about that perhaps can enhance already what you're doing. Um, and obviously those that aren't confident or you're generally okay then again I hopefully you'll find something really helpful from um, today's session and actually those statistics aren't surprising um, mm -hmm. I don't actually, know what you think Sue but um, I think any yeah. Uh, yeah I mean health and well-being because it's very personal and a sensitive um, area isn't it for somebody it's um, sometimes it could be hardest to know how to approach mm. absolutely and then I think we've just got one final quick poll here at this point, and that's really around a policy, whether you have a menopause policy itself. Okay. Yeah. I'll 
close that one and share those results. Okay, so great that there's 35% of you that have got a um, policy, that's really great, um, that's good to hear and um, hopefully, and I'm sure it is, um, supporting you and your managers in uh, addressing menopausal um, mm. health issues and obviously those that, that you that don't will come on to talk about it a little bit more um, and perhaps um, it may be something that you take away as an action perhaps afterwards. Okay. Lovely, thank okay, you Sue. You. Thank you. So um, really just to put the menopause into uh, context still, um, there were several definitions according to medical professions, uh, professionals and really the menopause itself it actually only occurs when somebody hasn't had a period for at least 12 months and the research is telling us that the average age that somebody gets to that point um, is 51 years of age and that's in the UK, UK data. But actually this isn't when the symptoms begin. You have a phase called the perimenopause which is a term given to the time leading up to this menopause and so that's when the symptoms can begin and actually the period of the peri perimenopause can begin anywhere between seven to ten years before the person ultimately has their last period. Um, bear in mind that it's not the same for everybody, everybody's different, some people might have a relatively short perimenopause but on the whole generally there's a lengthy period of time where people are experiencing sy symptoms as their body um, is changing and, and preparing for the menopause itself and I think that for me when I started to understand more about the menopause was a real eye-opener. You hear the term menopause generally and not necessarily so much about perimenopause. I mean we might nowadays more in recent times just because there's a lot of um, publicity about the menopause but um, actually for me that was a bit of an eye-opener and just understanding that people can have those symptoms and even people can have symptoms without realising that actually it is the perimenopause. And then of course you've got what's called the pre, premature, premature, sorry, menopause, when it's actually experienced before the age of 40. And statistics tell us that one in 100 women will experience premature menopause. Um, so that's something again to be um, aware of because there could be uh, cases uh, of that. We know that the menopause can also be brought on by medical treatment. So people that undergo cancer treatments, for example, those um, treatments themselves can actually bring the menopause on. Um, or if somebody is having surgery um, as well, for example. And it's also really important to know for employers that actually people who um, identify either as perhaps non-binary, they may be intersex or transgender, they too can also experience a menopause and I'll just come on to that in the next slide so um, I'll, I'll share more information on that. So really it is important that employers have in place a menopause policy um, because not only does it act as a practical tool for supporting employees but it ensures inclusive, inclusivity across the entire business. So in terms of um, inclusivity, um, you can get employees who are transgender, non-binary and intersex that can experience the symptoms. So for example those born female but identify as male but they have the female reproductive systems, they too can experience menopause. Or those born male but identify as female, they can actually experience symptoms that are similar to the menopause through the medical intervention that they're seeking um, as part of their transition process. And then somebody who identifies as non-binary, they too can also go through the menopause as well. You have what's called the term intersex and that's about somebody who is born with reproductive or sexual anatomy that doesn't fit with either male or female bodies. So again, that's just something to be aware of in terms of they too can also experience and undergo the menopause. So it is a complex area. Um, clearly the individuals um, in these areas would be seeking their own medical advice and treatment from their medical specialist, but it's 
equally still important for employers to just be mindful that um, the sensitivities that go on with this and uh, not to, I guess, make judgments and just make assumptions because actually the menopause can affect um, everybody in some way. So the important thing to say in terms of the symptoms, they can be very for each person, the length of time that the person goes through can also differ. But here you'll see um, many of the common symptoms, low mood, poor concentration, you've got the mood swings, brain fog, poor sleep, migraines. They're um, obviously more of the, the mental side of um, and the emotional side of experiencing the menopause. And you've got physical symptoms that in, can include your night sweats, hot flushes are probably the most common that you, you hear about. You can get changes to hair and skin. Uh, people start experiencing bone and joint problems. And even they can experience reoccurring urinary tract infections um, or even uh, irregular or heavy periods. So it really is debilitating for some. And as I said, the, the I guess the extent of the symptoms on a person will differ. Um, but nevertheless, it can be debilitating. And if we think about to those earlier statistics uh, that Bupa uh, gathered, you know, these kind of symptoms led to 900,000 employees leaving employment because of it. So, you know, we don't want to lose employees who fall into this age group who are highly skilled, highly experienced. They're typically at the peak of their careers, role models for younger workers, as I explained earlier. So really it makes business sense to actually start seeing how your business can take steps to support and retain those employees. Obviously, it's the right thing to do, not just from a business, it makes business sense, but it's the right thing to do about how we want to treat people. But we're now going to consider the impact um, on the workplace of these symptoms. And this is just to, to really illustrate, if we think about the physical and the mental symptoms that you can see here, um, you know, naturally it's going to lead to people wanting to or needing to take more frequent breaks. So if somebody's suffering from heavy bleeding, um, then clearly they're needing to take extra time out of the working day to deal with that. Um, migraines or even joint pain might lead to sickness absence or needing time out to attend medical appointments. You've then got from the mental side of things, your low moods, anxiety, um, you can probably see perhaps lower engagement, employee engagement, um, procrastination, uh, poor decision making in uh, how they complete their work, um, loss in confidence. These are all things that can, um, how the menopause can manifest itself in the workplace. Before I then come on to talk about the legal duties and obligations for employers, I just want to sort of run a quick poll. And it's just to really understand um, from you all what you think the uh, claims could be um, by an employee who um, raises concerns about how their employer dealt with the menopause. So we'll um, pull up the poll here. And just let us know if you think an employee can claim any of the following. Okay. Yeah. So what have we got? I will close that one and share those results. Yeah. Oh, okay. Yes, and everybody would in fact be right. Um, there is potential for claims uh, to be raised in regards to how um, an employer manages an employee's menopausal symptoms, and I'll come on to explain a little bit more. Um, obviously, the majority of you. Um, obviously have identified sex discrimination and I would probably say um, that's probably one of the main avenues of claim that and disability um, so mm -hmm. yeah let's come on to the legal context have you got any other thoughts Sue on that no, no that's uh, I agree totally yeah. um, they all could come into play um, yeah. but, um, particularly the sex and disability discrimination yeah. angles yeah okay okay Back of you. <laughs> Thank you. So first of all, under the Equality Act of 2010, 
um, the legislation protects employees from being discriminated against in the workplace and um, that can be relevant to somebody going through the menopause. Um, so first of all it could be on the grounds of their age and this is because obviously the menopause is generally age related. You've obviously got the disability, um, you know for some people the symptoms are so severe, so debilitating that it actually starts um, impacting on their normal day-to-day -day activities and obviously um, you're probably aware that the disability um, element under the Act there is a definition of what constitutes a disability and the menopause for some people can meet that, uh, that definition. Claims can also rise on the grounds of sex so if a female employee is treated less favourably to a male colleague and they believe it's because of the menopause that's obviously the, the avenue for raising a claim. And finally, claims can, in theory, be brought in regards to the gender reassignment. So, as I mentioned a moment ago on that slide, you know, somebody who is transgender, non-binary, intersex can actually experience menopausal symptoms. I would say, uh, practically, on a day-to-day -day, um, perspective, it's literally could probably your disability or your sex um, avenues that you'll see the claims come through. You then have claims for unfair dismissal. So, for example, somebody is dismissed for capability reasons, so they've been struggling in their performance, and actually their, their menopausal symptoms were a contributing factor to how they were performing at work. Um, that can lead to an unfair dismissal, and we know that through a tribunal case called Merchant um, versus British Telecoms. Um, now, that was actually the first menopausal tribunal case and we have had others since but in this particular case the employee raised um, a claim on the grounds of sex because they had told their employer they were suffering from menopausal symptoms um, the GP backed that up um, but the performance management process um, it did require managers to explore underlying health reasons but the manager didn't they didn't consider the impact of the menopause on that individual's performance and actually what they did do is they used their own experience and beliefs about the menopause to make judgments but ultimately um, BT lost that claim the employee was successful in claiming uh, sex discrimination they found, um, incidentally, that the employer would have treated a man suffering from similar symptoms actually differently. Um, and the tribunal also stated in their decision, it is self-evident that all women will experience their menopause in different ways and with differing symptoms and degrees of symptoms. So that's a really good learning point, just so that when you are managing somebody in the workplace, just bear in mind that everybody's journey, if you like, will be very different. And then if we think about health and safety, employees have the right not to be dismissed if they complain about or refuse to work in unsafe working conditions. So an employee could, for example, raise concerns about the workplace and how it perhaps makes their menopausal symptoms worse. Um, and so then if they're dismissed for, t uh, for taking action over their health and safety, then it can render a dismissal unfair. In fact, automatically unfair because when there's health and safety dismissals, uh, the normal two year qualifying period doesn't apply. So that's the context um, and the legal position as well around the menopause. So we'll now move on to talking about um, what you, we can do to support and practically deal with it um, in the workplace and to help support people. And first of all, it is about creating and setting the right workplace culture. It's, you know, having that workplace culture that supports open discussions, enabling people to feel okay to come forward, to, to ask for help, not be embarrassed, and it's about normalizing the subject but creating a culture isn't about one particular thing it often involves several things you know policies and procedures working practices but they need to be lived rather than just written down which sometimes is easier said than done um, but hopefully as I take you through um, these next slides it will give you some ideas as to how we can bring a, a workplace culture almost to life and engage with the menopause discussion. And I think the first thing to say in that is about having um, a written commitment. So having that menopause policy, because it sends a massive message to your workforce that you take it seriously, that you are accepting of it and you are supportive of how it can impact somebody and therefore you want to do all you can as a business to support them um, at that time. 
I mentioned health and safety a moment ago. Um, a massive practical step is to ensure your risk assessments um, incorporate um, checking and assessing risks from a menopausal uh, perspective. Um, you know, as a typical example, you know, we know that um, people going through the menopause are subjected to hot flushes and I suppose, I guess if you think about your risk assessment process, how can the, uh, what risk is there in terms of fluctuating temperatures and then what steps can you offer and, and put in place to minimise and mitigate against those risks. So really just make sure your risk assessments do consider people that um, may be going through the menopause. Line management training is absolutely crucial and fundamental because after all, it's your line managers that bring life to that policy that you've introduced. Educating them in the menopause, so the symptoms, who it affects, legal obligations, and sharing ideas and what they can do to help will make the overall experience for the employee that's going through it far, far better, and also protects the organisation from risk of tribunal claims. And, um, you know, training that also looks at how you can handle conversations, because it is a subject that is still taboo. Yes, we're hearing more and more about it in the news, but for many people, it is still a subject that perhaps they don't know how to approach. So line management training is really fundamentally important. Um, for helping create that workplace culture that is open to talk about the menopause. The next aspect is all around employee engagement. You want to encourage your entire workplace to be engaged with the topic, not just those who are going through it. So those who are managing someone who's experiencing, or perhaps it might just be a male colleague who isn't sure on what they can say or can't say. Um, so it's about how you can bring in um, processes or initiatives that can help drive that employee engagement. For example, you may want to introduce menopause champions, so a go-to person. So if somebody has any questions or needs guidance, that menopause champion can signpost the person to either internal or external sources of help. And just as that, um, soundboard, if you like, and um, that could be a, a huge positive measure to bring in place, especially, you know, if you're going through the menopause and you know your workplace offers menopause champions, I mean, that in itself sends a, a massive message, positive message. Another idea is perhaps um, if you're yet to introduce a policy or even if you have got your policy in place, carry out anonymous surveys. These could be really helpful. Um, as I said, particularly if you're at the start developing your policy, and they're helpful for um, creating that open culture. You know, ask people how do they feel uh, the menopause is supported at the moment um, in the workplace? What do they feel that they need that would help them um, in particular with going through um, the menopause? Or, you know, how would they need support or what does support look like if they're a line manager and are worried about you know what would happen if they have to start supporting somebody with it so anonymous surveys can be a really great tool for gathering insights from your employees about what they want how they're feeling and then that can help you in developing your uh, future plans for other initiatives there's also a menopause at work month every October so um, HR Solutions we always support it and do a lot of work around that month and it's about just even more communication around the topic so perhaps you could sign up to that initiative and just um, focus on um, October as a menopause month and promote the topic. Other um, Adaptation, so generally from a workplace, um, and this is probably more likely to impact people individually, um, then again, you've got to just bear in mind that symptoms could uh, meet the criteria of a disability under the Equality Act. So if you're in that position, then you need to be mindful that automatically you've got that legal requirement to put in place reasonable adjustments. But even if somebody and their health concerns don't meet that criteria, um, it is still really beneficial to the employee and, of course, the business to put in place adaptations. So these could be allowing flexible working. 
So maybe allowing somebody to reduce their hours, um, working part time, or even things like adjusting the start time, um, so that perhaps if they've if they're having difficulty sleeping um, and having disturbed nights, are they better perhaps starting at ten instead of nine and shifting the end time uh, back? Or as I said earlier, you know, somebody that perhaps may be bleeding really heavily, it's about supporting them and letting them know that they can take whatever breaks they need to support and, and manage that. Um, or it might be that they need a period of working from home if they are going through a period that is particularly heavy. You know, the last probably place they want to be is somewhere public, um, maybe in the workplace, so they may benefit and feel relieved knowing they can work from home. If you've got somebody that's struggling with memory or concentration, brain fog, um, it's about encouraging them to use reminders, to-do lists, whether it's on their PC or their phone, and just making those little tweaks so that they can still um, deliver on what they need to as part of their role. If somebody's feeling low or isolated, then think about what support networks you can start to build within the business. So I've talked about menopause champions, um, or it could be that you already offer an employee assistance programme it's about reminding the employee that you've got that tool available. Or if you haven't got an EAP, then you could potentially look at the cost of introducing one um, into the workplace. They are really beneficial for um, mental health and well-being, but also reducing and mitigating sickness absence and things. So they're just some examples of workplace adaptations. And then support services. So as line managers, we aren't medically qualified. And there are times when we ourselves need to recognise when somebody's asking for help from us, that actually what they're asking is um, us that we can't or we're not in a position to give any further advice or guidance because we simply don't know, we're not qualified. So it's recognising the boundaries and when to then redirect the individual to either their GP, perhaps engage with occupational health, um, because that's a great way of understanding what further support measures could be brought in, but also more about prognosis for their health and their conditions and any medical treatments that may be required. And as I said, if you've got an EAP programme, it's about directing your employees to that for help and support. Um, and there is a lot of external support available, and I'm going to sort of share that later on in the webinar. But I think the key message is just recognise that there are boundaries and that we can't always give the answers that people want us to be able to give um, because we just don't know and we're not qualified. So it's recognising at what point you need to then engage with professional um, individuals or organisations. So I'm going to run um, a couple of polls, but it's asking the same question and it's over a couple of polls just because there's so many options for the answers. So. We just would like to understand what current support that is in place within your own organisation. Um, so feel free to just to let us know. And as I said, this is part one of two. Okay. Yep. So if I close that one, I'll just share the results of that one first. Yeah, okay. These are looking good. So a, a lot of people do the flexible working. Yeah. Um, which I guess is the um the biggest mm. um the most popular request I would imagine. Um but yeah, there's a it's a good percentage of um, people offering training and um, yeah. adjustments. So I'll hide that yep. one and share the next one. Second half of this poll. <laughs> <laughs> and this is all about your key health, having the menopause champions, support groups. Do you offer any of these? OK, 
Hey. I'm loving these uh, statistics, these answers. Lots of good stuff going on. So I'll close that and share those results. So there we go, there's the last section. Mm. So a lot of user signposting and the yeah. uh, occupational health, which is which is great. I think the menopause yeah. champions is a slight is a slightly newer I con think, yeah. concept, and um, I think that will grow more as as people adapt it and adapt their cultures. I think that will come out of that, um, especially if it's a very male orientated environment. It might be hard to mm. have. <laughs> um, True menopause champions if, if there's not that many females in in the business but um um the be the yeah, majority you know where the majority kind of are going to yeah. fall but, um, but yeah i think that's good i will hide Brilliant. that thank you. Back you. <laughs> thank you so really just i guess as a summary here and a copy of the slides are going to be sent out to everybody sorry i should have mentioned that at the start um this is you know a list of and i'm sure there's many many more things that can be done and i guess you know if you use for example that anonymous survey that i talked about you could probably find out a lot more uh, uh, initiatives that you could um develop and introduce but these are um what we've just talked about here so before we come to the last part of the webinar with your questions there's a few slides around the support but also just want to run a quick poll and it's about you know what what are you going to look at implementing in your own place of work following this webinar and again I think it's one of two Sue Okay, I will yep. close that poll, share those results. Brilliant. And I think all of these collectively go towards creating that open culture, doesn't it? Um, mm. And allowing people to feel comfortable in talking and asking for help. Um, yeah, adjustments to performance. Mm. I think that's probably an area that perhaps people don't quite realise the impact it can have. Mm. Yeah, so that's good. And then the second part is just um, asking if there's anything else, got some other options there. There you go. So, I have Jen looking good as well. Yep, I will close that poll and share those results. There we go. Lovely. So, um, that's great. Great to hear that um, everybody's sort of taking some ideas away from today. That's really what we wanted um, everybody to do, just um, make you know we wanted to help make a change some way so that's really great and then i think we've got the final poll sue and it's a repeat of the first one at the very start of the uh, webinar and it's around the confidence has today helped you in any way And of course, we're not medical experts either. <laughs> mm. <laughs> so, okay, I'll share those results. Right. 
Oh, well, that's um, great to see there's that improvement in how you're feeling. Um, and we're going to be taking questions now, and perhaps that might, for the 5% of you, it might help um, help with that. Um, because I think it was when you get into the questions, that's when you really have uh, good discussions. So um, we'll move on. And just to sort of highlight some information and support before those questions, um, when you get the slides, you'll get the links, obviously, that are shown under these um, headings here. So you've got some interesting information by the uh, Faculty of Occupational Medicine of Royal College of Physicians. You've got the NHS, and there's a web page there. The Menopause Charity um, for um, MIA members. Uh, there's also the My Menopause Buddy, and there's a link to that for you. And then um, Bupa. Um, and if anybody's a knowledge base user um, and has access to all our uh, templates, uh, policies, letters, etc., or our articles, then you'll find this information here on our knowledge base. So you can download a copy of our menopause policy if you wish. Um, and then we've also got some articles as well. So, so we're now moving to questions. So as I said at the outset, we had some raised um, in advance, part of the registration process. And obviously, um, hopefully we've had some questions get raised as we've gone through today's webinar. So Sue and I are going to take your questions, uh, but we're going to ask Rob, um, our senior HR consultant, to raise those so we can have a discussion about the menopause in the context of a male colleague with questions and not really knowing how to support and from that angle. Um, so Rob, do you have your first question? I do, good morning. So if I'm providing feedback to a female colleague and they go red in the face, how do I know if they're embarrassed about the feedback I'm giving or if they're having a hot flush? What, what, what should I do? <laughs> so, um, that, it, I guess we've only obviously got limited information from what's been submitted, but um, what we want to get to is a point where managers are having those open conversations and know whether somebody is experiencing and going through the menopause or not. So I suppose that is an important factor. If you don't know, then yes, you've got to really be careful in, in what approach you take um because um you can't just assume they could be so let's say that you know that person is going through the menopause you could just ask you know um do you want to take a break or um can i help in any way in terms of i know this is um feedback that i need to give you um you don't have to necessarily mention hot flush are you having a hot flush i would avoid that approach but it's more the probing question say are you okay if you're recognizing there's a change in their posture or um, the behaviors i don't know so do you have anything to add on that that's quite a tricky one it is a tricky one i think i'd be i'd be um if they were appearing uncomfortable with it happening which which um is, is usually the case um, you could ask if they, you know, do you want to take a few minutes? Do you want to take a break? Do you want to go and get a drink? You know, glass of water, that kind of thing. Just reassure them. Um, shall we? Shall we um, continue? You know, a little bit later. I guess just just showing that you're understanding. If but that's if they're showing they're uncomfortable. If they keep they're just carrying on, then continue as normal and kind of. Yeah. Um, it's it's more how they they react as well. Um, and. It, and also, as you said, you know, depends on their culture and what's in place already in the company for them to turn to for support if they're finding those interactions um, uncomfortable. Um, mm. But you can't not not continue and give feedback and and hold those conversations. You have to continue. You just have to think: is there an adjustment like um, making sure the room's well ventilated, making sure they can take a break if they need to, and you know there's water available and all that, all the things that you might do anyway to make somebody as comfortable as mm. possible when you're going, when you're having those meetings. Does that yeah, help? And Rob? I, think it, and if, <laughs> I was just, just going to add that if you've got that uh, that culture and people are quite open and say they know they've already told you previously, 
you know, you just simply say, oh, are you OK? Do you want to take a break? And they might just in return have that confidence to be able to say, oh, I'm just having one of my hot flushes kind of thing. They might then just prevent, pro provide you with that response. Um, but it's about asking, are you OK? Um, yeah. Are you happy to continue? Yeah. yeah. Does it help, Rob? Thank you, yes. Um, we another question or I see that Tina Holmes has got a hand up. Yeah. It's okay. Um I've messaged her separately. Yep. Uh, um a lady in the office keeps opening the window when the heating's on. Other team members are moaning they're cold. How should I handle this? So when you have the next opportunity where you're having your one to one conversations or you get that moment to privately have a conversation um i guess it's linking it into your well-being conversations um and so not necessarily saying i'm getting complaints but it's about um do we need to how are you getting on in the workplace with your symptoms do we need to do anything um do i need to provide you perhaps a fan would a fan help so that is trying to have those well-being conversations um, and then you could subtly bring it in saying you know obviously we need to get the balance so that um, you're supported but obviously um, as a department then obviously we've got to consider everybody else um, you could take that kind of approach um, but certainly a well-being conversation so do you have any other thoughts on that yeah, yeah, I agree. Um, you know, in my experience, clients have um, provided a personal fan for the individual yeah. and and allowed them to sit in an area that's a little bit more um, um, their own area so they can yeah. kind of condition it as best they can to, to help suit them and just pop the fan on. You can get some silent fans these days that... Mm. that helps you can continue to work take calls etc and so you have your own personal space that's in the comfortable environment yeah. you need rather than affecting the whole team but yeah I think that's that as you say the most popular yeah so you might be getting those complaints in the moaning but you're not necessarily you're taking action but you're not necessarily exactly telling the individual or oh, you're causing all of these complaints or anything it's handling it sensitively by just sense checking how's your workplace do we need to provide you xyz kind of thing okay thank you when completing a return to work interview if someone says their levels of absence are a result of menopausal symptoms do i count these absences uh, as part of our bradford backward score or do i need to make an adjustment so if we think about obviously what i said um earlier in that if it's potential for a disability then there'll be an element of a legal requirement to make adjustments to your processes so you could uh you could do it um, a couple of ways you can either um make an adjustment um you can make an adjustment to the bradford factor score um to their your process your structure for how you manage absence whatever trigger system you have in place by doing that you're carrying out a reasonable adjustment um if it's not a disability for the purpose of the equality act obviously there's still the element of we want to treat people well and support people um and i suppose it's having that common sense decision making in your absence process that because um, you've got to be consistent as well in how you manage general health and well-being, whatever the type of health issue. Um, but it's how you can, um, what, what I guess, allowances do you want to give for that? But I guess you know your legal parameters going into that absence meeting because you'll have an idea whether it's likely to be a disability or not. Hopefully, if not, then obviously you perhaps get that Oki Health to help in that decision making for you um but yes you could certainly adjust your policy thank you thanks so would it be worth getting an occupational health report 
prior to taking any formal action against somebody that yeah, is claiming. I would, yeah, yeah, I would, um, because if they're in that meeting saying, oh, it's because of this, you know, X, Y, Z, or menopausal symptoms, then pause that process whilst you then go and get that support from occupational health and then that report can give you more information on it and give you some suggestions about how it could be accommodated and supported ultimately it's for the business to make a decision as to what they can and can't accommodate based on what is reasonable in the context of their business um, but certainly um, seek occupational um, health advice or write to the GP the next question is, a lady you previously let us know they are suffering with the menopause keeps being really moody and is having an impact on the rest of the office. Uh, how should I approach this and should I tell the team about the lady's symptoms so they're more tolerant of her mood swings? Okay, so the, the big thing to remember is confidentiality and unless you've had um, conversations with that individual about what they're happy with you sharing or not sharing then obviously don't say anything i would if you're getting feedback you know again it's coming back to that well-being conversation that you have whether it's a one-to-one -one as part of that discussion or just taking them to a side to say look i'm really concerned and worried for you i've observed xyz i know you've talked to me previously about you're struggling with the symptoms of you know you're not sleeping well um and you can take that uh, welfare approach and just checking in with them and um, I guess then you can sort of broaden the conversation around um, I've observed for example you could do it so that you personally have seen perhaps a, a change in their behavior and you can just say look I want to help you shall we go down Oki Health or do you need anything from me um, so yeah so i wouldn't inadvertently just tell the rest of the team that oh um it's okay victoria's going through the uh, menopause that absolutely can't happen because obviously it's a it's somebody's personal data that uh, you'd be disclosing you know and also as part of your conversations with your employees you know if they've come to you and they're really struggling um you know you could have that conversation about you know is there anything I can do to help in terms of um, you know they might feel bad about I don't know letting the team down if they're always off or they're feeling really disengaged or and you could just say well what would you like me to do what would you like me to um, help with from a communicating with the team or you know they might be happy for you to give some context to the team that perhaps you're struggling or they might not be happy um, but it's just seeing with the individual how they want to be supported um, generally with their symptoms thank you <clears throat> a lady keeps making mistakes and forgetting things and blames it on brain fog this is having an impact on our customers how should i approach this so again, uh, this is, you know, wh when you're having those performance conversations or you're having to feedback on work performance, you know, it's really always important to ask the question, is there anything going on that I need to be aware of? Is there anything outside of work that perhaps is impacting you? Or those kind of welfare questions. Um, and, um, and then it's about, obviously, if they're sharing with you that, I get this really bad brain fog, my mind goes completely blank. Um, then it's about working together about what little steps can be taken to help her prevent forgetting things or uh, reducing the uh, opportunity to make mistakes. So like I said um, earlier, uh, having to-do lists, um, using your Outlook calendar to schedule things, um, or even if uh, depending on what the job is of course it might be they have checklists so they always have to remember to cover these items off when they're in a conversation about it say if they're in a contact center kind of environment so it's trying to find practical ways that can help um, them with focusing on the job in hand um, I would say 
Thank you. Uh, the last one I have is one of our team keeps being late and blaming it on not being able to sleep due to the menopause. Am I just meant to accept this? So, I mean, fundamentally, um, in general, an employer really, um, the starting position is you trust what your employees are telling you. That's got to be the heart of a contract. You've got to just, you know, trust. Obviously, in general, I'm talking about there might be some really exceptional situations where there could be other things that make you not. But that's a different webinar entirely. <laughs> but if somebody is coming to you saying they're really struggling because they're having problems sleeping, then use that as an opportunity to say, well, OK, what can we do to help you? Will it help me to adjust your hours? So it's not like you're reducing the hours or anything like that. You just perhaps put them back at the start time or um, do you want to? Uh, it could be the opportunity to seek medical help and guidance. Um, so I think in answer to the question, should I just accept it? I think on the whole, generally, yes, because You've got to trust your employees if you start from the position of you don't trust your employees and then that i mean it will i guess create a very different conversation um so yeah so i would take it that you would then look to see how you can um support them and what tweaks you may need to make to their uh job role working hours to help mitigate it you probably might be seeing performance issues if they're struggling to sleep as well. So it could just be that welfare meeting that you have with them. Thank so you. So you've got anything else to add on those? No, no, absolutely. I think you answered it. Um, yeah, fully. Thank you, Rob. Oh. And hopefully that helps. So have we got any as well from the... Um, yeah, we've got, we've got a question. Um, somebody's asking actually whether there's a place for a period policy or something similar to support those in the years before the menopause, which um, is the menopause. Is, yeah, and prior to that, those who have oh, okay. um, um, ongoing yeah. challenges, uh, you can have that at any age. Um, kind of. I interesting question that and i'd probably be inclined to maybe incorporate something if you want to incorporate mm. something somewhere perhaps within an absence management policy or or even it could there could be an acknowledgement in the menopause policy i'm not quite sure but i think if you want to have something written down rather than having a standalone policy perhaps incorporating it or have a health and well-being policy that all in the health and well-being all of them. Yeah. yeah 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 which is what a lot do i think and they cover off different aspects of health mm. and well-being and encourage people um to to manage yeah the health at any age and, and that's encouraging use of um of, of other things and apps and yeah and other actually you no know, it's it's that is a wide. good question mm isn't it because actually it, having periods you know that in itself can be debilitating for many many people mm, exactly. um, even yeah, without exactly. having got to yeah yeah mm -hmm. so that's a good question and perhaps something i'm going to think about now for our policies yeah as i said i think it's adaptation of the um yeah. of the health and well-being policy a more generic thing about lifestyles and um yeah that, that we're encouraged to do aren't we as as employers as well to is to look at supporting our staff in um in in managing their own work-life mm. balance and, and the lifestyle that they lead to enable them to enjoy both mm. <laughs> um so yeah the, and the other question we had was around um what sort of questions could they ask in in the employee survey i think this is about okay understanding what people would like to see and helping them to form your policy um, mm. and, I, and I'm guessing the questions are really around what are the challenges you've been experiencing in the workplace or you've experienced personally and that you can ask questions around would you find it helpful if or what would you like to see or what support yeah. would you like to get or do you appreciate the EAP we offer would you like something different you know I think it's, it's just questioning them and all the benefits and um, office environment things that you either do offer and 
you know, do they appreciate them? So, so that you're targeting your investment in development in in the areas people want, not the areas you think they want. So you yeah. may think it, it makes a really nice atmosphere in the office if you have loads of plants and buy fruit and stuff. But if you're throwing away the fruit at the end of the week because it's all mouldy, um, are is that actually working? So asking them, what is it you would like to see? You know, um, yeah. and um, and all around, you know, what would make the environment more comfortable for you to work in? What would um, you don't have to commit to um, delivering everything they want, but it helps inform your decisions around what you might want to build into your yeah. policy and um, all the things. Would you, you know, would you benefit from? Um, like the menopause champions or a health and well-being champion in the organization somebody you can approach mm. uh, to talk to about things in confidence um that is not your line manager necessarily so it, it it's really um i guess it's asking all those questions um, yeah you could incorporate questions as well to help um you know so it's for everybody not yeah you know exactly. the whole yeah. workforce it's about um would you like more information or education on the subject? <laughs> Would you like, uh, do you feel you need help in handling conversations with a work colleague? Because then, you know, you're getting the input of both male and female employees, aren't you? <laughs> Which is really yeah. important. You know, if we think about those questions that Rob's kindly shared with us from a male perspective, um, you know, it's important to get everybody's view, not, you know, not just those that are going through it. Yeah, and, and you could widen the scope of the survey and help inform yeah. other policies. So, mm. um, which would be really, really useful because it could help develop your culture as well. I think a, a lot of people probably do it on the back of um, either an engagement survey or um, sort of a survey around the culture of the mm. organisation if they're looking at either enhancing it or developing it because it all boils down to how the company as a whole manages their staff and supports their staff and mm. considers their health and well-being and their welfare in any context not just the menopause so it's kind of building on that but because it's particularly only recently um come to a head where the menopausal um symptoms <clears throat> Are, have been gone have gone kind of unnoticed or unrecognized for mm. for a long time um and that's hence those really high statistics and we we need to kind of reduce those statistics of people leaving or yeah, feeling absolutely. that's the only option to them is to leave work um whereas um we want to you know keep those valuable skills in the business and and help people to um to grow through that period um even if it means changing for a little bit changing what they do or how they do it yeah yeah thank you i think that's all questions? the questions yeah okay brilliant thank you and we're just a little bit past 11 so um i'm just going to go through the last few remaining slides with you all um i did mention our knowledge base earlier so um that is basically an online portal where you can access um, all our template documents, whether they're policies, letters, um, guidelines, checklists, and obviously we have lots of articles and guides on there as well. So if you want to find out more, then obviously our, our website there um, will give you access to how you can find out more. We do offer training, so line management training as well here. You'll see we offer ILM level three and five, and all of our other uh, line management training um, you get the CBD points as well for those. So if you are in need of any training, then do um, be sure to get in contact with us. Um, for our regular attendees, you'll know that we run our webinars monthly. So the next one for February, it's all going to be about effective performance, but at all levels within the organisation. So that's on the 15th. And then we are seeing in March a webinar that's going to be all about um, supporting long-term sickness. And at the end of March, we're running our annual um, virtual employment law seminar. There's going to be a lot, a lot of changes this year in terms of employment law. Uh, we already know there's a lot to be introduced in April. So, um, and then even later on in the year as well. So um, join us if you can 
for that live webinar or seminar should I say it's slightly longer than a normal one because obviously there's going to be a lot of content and it's our annual seminar so um, do let us know do register for those events and then I introduced at the start of our um, webinar today that we're supported today and co-facilitating this with MIA and um, this is just to let you know for uh, for their members that we've got um, webinars coming up so you've got the um, in January instant book and apprenticeships there's a connect dinner um, international convex MIA AGM in February so there's lots of information there so uh, please do check out their website and a final poll is just really if you'd like to find out more from any of the services whether it's um, MIA and uh, the Meeting Industry Association or any of our services, whether HR, payroll, knowledge base, training. So do let us know and then uh, we can follow up with you after today. Okay, I'll close that now. Lovely, thank you. That's brilliant. And that's really just to bring our webinar to a close. So thank you everybody um, on behalf of HR Solutions and MIA for uh, joining us in this uh, really important uh, webinar. Um, we hope that you found it informative. Um, if you do need any further information, then um, do let us know. Um, but hope to see you in next month's webinar as well. Thank you to Sue. Rob and Hannah as well. Thank you everybody. Thank you.